Okay. Thank you. Um, I felt badly because I didn't allow enough time last time for Q&A, so I thought we'd take the first 20, 25 minutes to start out, and then I'll go to the slides because you have them. I'll just rapidly go through some, and then I still want to save time. I think I made a mistake because I thought I had more time than I had, so I apologize. Usually I don't. I'm bombarding you with too many slides, I think, but uh, hopefully you receive some new information or thought, have some thought-provoking questions. So at this time, I'll take smart questions. How's that? <laughs> do we have to do something about hearing your questions, or will you pick up the question? OK, and I also will repeat questions. How's that? OK. OK. I'm ready. OK, she's ready, and I can repeat. Questions. Where was the question? Thank you. I'm Veronique Boscard from Conestoga College, and thank you, Dr. Jeffries, for a very interesting talk this morning. Um, I was wondering if you're able to share some of the results of that randomized study that you spoke about earlier, or is that still in the write-up phase? Um, thanks for asking. She wants to know about the results, if I know of any, from the randomized study from the National Council. Data just was completed May 30th, in the end of the month. It's across 10 schools. I have not been privy to the data at all. It's been, uh, there's a data monitoring board and that's been sent into Chicago every month, every week, all of that. I did debrief with students just because from my academic affairs hat, not because I was part of the study or anything because I wasn't part of the study. I helped consult with the design for the National Council. But just some things I've seen, just to let you know, and these are just anecdotals from students, so it's not, I didn't see anything. But when I debrief with them, what I found, and some amazing things, when students were in the 25% group or 25%, they ended up bonding. It, uh, uh, they became a small community within the School of Nursing. So even the 50% group at the end, nobody wanted to quit the study because they're all in it together. And they, they realized they're contributing to the science of nursing education in the area of, of, of simulation pedagogy. And some, some um, the students said, I'll, I'll just quote, I wouldn't have passed OB if I didn't have SIMS. They learned so much of putting things together, and they, they were doing well. They felt they did better on their tests. This is all anecdotal. I, I don't know. We do have exam scores. We can track, you know, what we're in 50%, 25%. Beginning, I haven't seen any of that data. Um, also, I was saying at lunch, many times when we had so many hours to do SIMS, in the morning, they would be in SIMS, and then we put them back in SIMS again so they get to replicate, because students always want to go back in and do it again, don't they? And we never have time, because we have 120 students, 150 students we have to put through. They love going back and being re-immersed in it, and they get it right. You know, they, they want to do well. The students want to be good nurses. I mean, that's not a novel idea, uh, so they want to get back in there. Let's see, other things that came out. When I said a smaller community, at our school, every semester for clinical, it's online registration. So maybe if you're my buddy, we might say, we're going to go on Tuesday. We want this site, so we'll sign up together. And then usually it's random, and I don't know who's in my clinical group. But the, so we knew we had to put 25% in. There were probably four sections of clinical for them and four sections of 50. But anyway, they, um, they didn't want to be separated. Once you got in a group of eight, they become very comfortable because you've seen me make mistakes, I've seen you, and it's not humiliating any longer. And what we saw through semester one, two, three, four, it became less stressful, less anxious. They, they, they were used, to, I don't want to say the word performing, but they were doing it. They, they got it, they were managing, and the anxiety was really down. <coughs> so those were just some of the tidbits. Uh, oh, one other thing, I think some, even if the findings, there's no significant difference between the control, 25, 50%, I think that's fine. It's just showing we're not harming at 50. And I think the other thing you're going to find from the study, again, 10 areas, geographics make a difference. I'm in urban Baltimore where we have wonderful hospitals. There's babies born every day. There's all kinds of problems. We can psych mental health is all around us. But you get into rural Nebraska or somewhere, they might have two peds patient in seven weeks. You know, that's not a very good peds experience. So simulations are far, far higher quality than, you know, that clinical experience. That is a very significant <coughs> thought. 
when we think about <coughs> education across our province, or any province, frankly, and we can't rely on the urban downtown hospitals in Toronto or Grand River here or wherever to do all the education for everybody, but we still have to have competent practitioner graduates from every college in this province. And so it's a really, really important comment that you just made. Sorry. I just wanted to emphasize that. Any other? The next one. Oh, that's good. Dr. Jeffries, I, yeah, thank you again. We're really enjoying it. Um, when you in, indicated earlier that 90% of the educators uh, felt that their students were prepared for practice, was that the, just their perception of their, or were they measuring it against state or national competencies? What made them feel that their students were ready? Just their, That's a just great their question. <laughs> I, I think it was just, I, it, it, was, it was like an 87 item survey or something. Right. So there were many, many survey questions right. and that was pulled out. It, I, the question didn't read based on these X competencies because in, in the states, schools of nursing, we all have different competencies. <laughs> we are not standardized at all. State of Oregon, I think, has got an ACNE. They're trying to do some state standardization, but we are no, no, we're not standardized. However, we do have essentials we have to speak to from our accrediting body that's thread through, but how we meet those essentials looks different. But truly, when it's all said and done, whether it's a two-year, three-year, four-year, we still prepare professionals, communication, knowledge workers. They're probably all similar, yeah. but there's not a standardization. Right. But I think, <coughs> since before I got into simulations, I thought my students knew more than they did. I'll, I'll speak for myself. I think we have high expectations, and we think they get it when they don't get it, and we don't know that until you immerse them in simulations. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, didn't you? You want to say, didn't you, re didn't you know this? Even just the difference between hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia or something that makes yeah. total sense to us. But they, no, that. but they haven't had that experience. I said at lunch, we did a care of postpartal hemorrhage. This is a true story. And the faculty had talked about standing orders, protocol, and emergency. You got you to gotta do this. You, know, you don't have time to call the doctor, but go ahead and get the IV started, doing whatever you do in postpartal hemorrhage. And... Um, so in the sim, the student called the physician, didn't use the standing orders protocol and all that. And the physician said, you know, did you start, you know, go the standing order? Oh, no, is that what that's for? So she finally connected the dots with what those were for in that experiential learning activity. But that's what happens many times. We can, we can read, we can assign 600 pages to read and talk three hours about it. But until they do it, they don't understand. <coughs> I'm Tim Willett, the Director of Research and Development for Sim1. Um, so in the past six months, we've seen a few meta-analyses published and, and a couple other systematic reviews looking at different aspects of simulation, but with a focus on the, its effectiveness. And the, the results have been across the board, generally, yes, very positive, even better than other things mm -hmm. that, that we could do. So I'm just wondering what your perspective is on the state of the evidence for simulation and where research ought to go next if if it is the case that we've proven simulation, so where do we go from here? Okay, great question. He, he asked, this, where's the state of the science, the state of the evidence with simulation, and where, where we need to go with it? First of all, I, th I think we can quit testing. We know it works. There's plenty of documentation it works. To what depth it works is another thing. I mean, there's study after study, if you want to look at resuscitation, pediatric resuscitation, they go through simulation. They save lives. They resuscitate quicker. They defibrillate quicker when they're in simulation of training. We know that. In surgical techniques, medicine, they use simulators. That makes a difference. Where the bigger things are, I'll speak in nursing, when these process scenarios, we want to know if they're making the right decisions and if they're prioritizing and delegating and all that. So you, you got to look at what that scenario is set up for and, and those particular outcomes. And then how do we measure? And you got to have the tools. Many times in nursing, we use checklists. You know, did they do it? or even proficiency, it took them 13 seconds before they did, you know, assess responsiveness or whatever. Um, but we've got to look at, th those are things. Where, we, where I think we need to go is looking at the value of simulations. We, we know they're working like in resuscitation and all that, but what I said earlier is taking it into the patient outcomes area, you got you got to tra translate that over. Because funders are more apt to fund grants and all that when it's about the, the care, the health care 
of the Canadians, of the Americans, whatever. They want to know, are we making difference in lives? I care about students like you do and outcomes, and we want better learners. But you got, but better learners mean better graduates, mean better caregivers and quality safe environments. So you got to make that connection. And those are harder to measure. I mean, <clears throat> translating to practice, just what I'm even saying with this National Council study, I mean, there's so many variables you've got to control. Who's going to do that? However, I do think there's a chance with simulations. Say if it's care of an MI patient, and then you want to, you've done this in SIMS, and you want to translate that. Can they care for an MI patient better over in the clinical setting because they've been in, immersed in here? I think we're so sophisticated now. There's simulation centers that look like real hospitals with six bed units and all this. You get standardized patients. That's the human response that sometimes we have missing with the, the mannequin. I mean, you still get human response, but it's a mannequin. You get standardized patients, and these, these folks are real. They look real. So I think we can do a lot more studying in research fields within STEM centers than we're doing, but you just need funding. And in summary, we're in embryonic stages for this research. It's a, it's a new science. It's a new state. In 2003, I quoted you earlier, that's when we started looking at that framework and the literature. It was sparse. Is it any better today? It's better. It's not where we need. I mean, if you look at online education, you know, that started back in 2000, or clear back in the 90s, even a little bit earlier, but then the body of science started coming back in the 90s, early 2000s. And that's better now. We've got all that evidence, and people are embracing it much more. But I remember back in 1999, first starting my first online course, because my dean gave me a stipend to do a summer course. Thought it was great. <clears throat> but remember how skeptical people were? How could people learn online? They can't do that. It's got to be face to face. We're kind of the same way now with SIMS and clinical education. And I only brought a little bit about the clinical education. I was going to talk about a little bit more about the state of the science there. there there's not a lot. We just, we just keep doing it. It's, it's a sacred cow. We don't give up. It's, it's just something we, that's, that's the gold standard. <coughs> I so appreciate the expertise and the knowledge that you've brought here today. And I, but I'm interested in mining your uh, knowledge in another way. Um, and perhaps it's my very practical bent. But I'm interested to find out if you could identify for us, you know, top five, top ten, top three, I'll take as many as you can give us, holes that you've fallen into mm, on the road uh, to, to making this kind of experience happen for students. Okay, I love that question because we chat a little bit and told her to be sure and ask the audience. <coughs> These are the pitfalls, and I came back after you asked it. I came down, because I have, I could go on and on. And she said top three, five, ten. It's like, oh my goodness. That's the publication I want to read. It is, and now you've got me going on this. Now, maybe on the plane ride now, I'll go start this. <clears throat> these are the pitfalls, not what to do. Don't do these. I did them. I loved your introduction, because I have been in the weeds. I've done, I have done this. I've come through the ranks. So when I speak, it's from experience. And I've, I speak from watching my colleagues and being with my colleagues. So it's not like I'm just pulling this out of the air, but th these are pitfalls. I've, I've uh, committed many with our team. One thing, um, I'll just, I, now I gotta look at my, use my glasses. And these are no, not in hierarchy or order. So just, I wanna preface that. When you're embarking on simulations within your, whether it's your academic institution or your, in, in your uh, practice organization or whatever, do not leave out leadership. Leadership has to be on board. My former dean, not the one I have now, <clears throat> every time I asked for resources, she never got it. She didn't understand. I'm not trying to be negative, but she just didn't. And finally, one day, she says, Pam, are you, are you trying to tell me clinical education using SIMS, is, it costs more money? I said, yes, it does. <laughs> it does. But that was a pitfall. I needed to include her early. These are the resources we need. It's about quality, and this is where we're going. And I, need to tell her, I needed to tell her the vision that I was going because she didn't know it. If you don't tell somebody the vision, they you, you don't assume they know that. You have to paint that picture. Another pitfall, and people do it all the time, is um, <clears throat> with faculty or you're embarking on the simulation-based curriculum or getting SIMS, they forget the professional development of faculty. That's key. I would rather have professional development of faculty before I before the mannequins, quite truthfully. It's about the pedagogy. The pedagogy is an immersive pedagogy. You're setting up where they're portraying the, the scope of practice, like I said. 
a student can portray, you know, somebody with abdominal pain, post appendectomy or whatever. But it's about the pedagogy where they're doing, then you're, you're reflecting afterwards what they did right or wrong. But they actually get to do that. So don't forget the professional development. Very quickly, I'll just read through some of these. People that don't want to do SIMS, don't worry about them. I used to worry about them. I wanted to get everybody on board, one happy family and team. Forget it. I work with early adopters and I get to mid. Those late adopters, either they'll come on because students will pressure them or they'll leave the institution. <laughs> I'm not going to mess, no, I'm serious. You, just, you can spend a lot of time, it can drag the energy out of you. You go with the early adopters. Start with champions, make them visible, do posters on them, put them in the newsletter, get your news media out here and talk about the champions, do it. And then more people want to go, oh my gosh, well she's done it, I can do it. And when I, this is a small example, but when I did online, <clears throat> I brought in online instruction at Johns Hopkins. People kicked and screamed. They didn't want to do that because they face to face and all that. But um, and this is being recorded. <laughs> I mean, this is just for your audience. But anyway, um, one person I got on board because she was heavy in nursing and politics and policies and all that. So I asked her if she wanted to do an online course, and I was going to co-facilitate that with her. She was the she was the person that couldn't even turn the computer on, couldn't even plug it in. But I got her on board, so when everybody, and, and Rosemary will appreciate that, when Rosemary could do it, everybody thought, I can do it. <laughs> so, and she loves it. Today, she's got a new skill set. She's teaching. Uh, she retired, but part-time. She loves it. She's a great facilitator on online learning, but she was a champion. The other one, <clears throat> pitfall, don't, uh, if you're a leader or director, or you're over your budget, give faculty resources and support. I almost get Dear Abby type emails, you know, Dear Abby, you know, the Dear, you know, I, I got this problem. So many people are alone. There's so many single SIM directors out there and they have no team, they, know how, they have no support, and they're told to do it all. And they don't know, they can't, first of all, they can't do it all and they feel very alone. And I, I have talked to so many people like that, but one of the things, they have to be brave, they have to do a business plan, they have to look at, I need resources and this is why and, and this, the, I'll get these outcomes. You've got to have a plan. Another uh, thing, just very quickly, um, reward your SIM team. Get, it, get, another fall, uh, get a SIM technologist, SIM tech person. I've had faculty tear up as much equipment I could have paid for a SIM tech versus trying to fix the equipment, honestly. It's, it's a very valued piece, SimTech. And I, I, I spoke at AAC, and that's the states. It's a big deans and directors meeting. I said, give your, get a SimTech, technologist, whatever. It, it, it'll save you money. Um, didn't establish guidelines. Establish guidelines for your Sim Center, your faculty. If you, I, I, I did not, used to faculty, if they wanted to do SIMS, come on in, they can do it. Well, they tear up mannequins. They don't know how to do the control room, all that kind of stuff. You need training. At Hopkins, I said there were three phases of training you had to go through before you embarked on simulations because I didn't want things torn up. And it only takes, if you're beginning level, your foundation's fundamentals, if students, if they're done poorly, students get a taste of poorly done sims and they hate them. They hate them because they think that's what they're all like and they're not because you, got, you had somebody that didn't know how to do them and it set everybody off on the wrong path. Um, <clears throat> So that's an orientation plan for your faculty uh, and, and your SIM center and all that. And the other pitfall I don't make, but many people do, and I'm just saying that, is they sometimes they value SIMs less than clinical education. I've had people email me saying the workload wasn't equitable, meaning if they were in the SIMs, it wasn't compared to clinical education, so they wanted to just give them half the pay for double the work because SIMS were, it, they just saw it as opposite. It was less in a real clinical world. Where we've just talked this morning, it's really not. It's double intense, you gotta prepare, everything like that. So those are some of the do's and don'ts and pitfalls and I've been there, done that. And don't assume faculty know. I mean, my very first SIM we set up, it was, we set it up, I said it's in room 202 whatever and it was bringing, each faculty was supposed to bring their clinical group over and do care of a diabetic patient. They had no more clue how to run this or do anything than, than any, I, I just thought they probably knew. They, di they didn't know. And lastly, if you're running nine to ten sections of SIMS and you're in, 
I always have a summary sheet and we didn't because what are we trying to get out of the sim? These are the summary bullet points because if there's eight groups, there may be eight different summaries. <laughs> another faculty might take it this way, another one this way. What, what are you trying to prove so it's standardized? Oh, lastly, have a repository for your sim scenarios, how you're going to categorize them. Are you going to categorize them by population, by disease, by because then it can get real messy if you're not organized from the beginning. In particular, if you get in a consortium, you all are going to share scenarios or whatever. Make it online, 24-7 access. You don't want to wait till somebody comes and unlocks their office to get some scenarios in a notebook somewhere. Uh, it's it's got to be accessible. Thank you. <laughs> wondering if you could elaborate on the interprofessional um, simulation research. I know that you had commented briefly about how we had some more uh, research up here as in Canada. Uh, is there a lack of research or is that just another field open totally? I know just if you could elaborate on that. About IPE yeah. and the research and yeah. what's going just on. What's happening in that realm of simulation. Okay, good, good. Now, we. I would say in America, we're talking the talk a lot. Everybody wants to do interprofessional education. We are. I mean, I'll, I'll say at Hopkins, we have an IP collaborative. I'm co-leading with medicine. You have to have the right people at the table, and the leaders have to be decision makers that can move it. And so in our IP collaborative, we, we've written a mission and vision and a strategic. We've got small working groups for undergraduate and med student education, graduate education, infrastructure, culture, changing the culture. And then we also have IPE faculty development. So these are kind of our working groups. And when we're working in groups, we use Canadian literature a lot. We're always, we've got a compass tool from you guys. There's a bunch, you, you guys are really doing well and the literature out there from Canada is fantastic. So we're looking all the time to see what you're doing to bring back in. This interprofessional education though is really, really important. And simulations is one venue to really get, that, to be practiced together. And I did that at my former institution, IU, and I'm working on it here at Hopkins, too. We're doing it. But at uh, IU, we built a 30,000-square-foot SIM center together, a hospital, school of medicine, and school of nursing. And it was a huge collaborative. And I must say that we were collaborative. It, it worked very well. We were a good team. But just as the SIM center was being built together, and as medicine comes in, social work, RT, any of these we all, we all are very different in, in our, our lens, our perspective, and even how we run SIMS. So one of the first things I did when we had this IPE collaborative in the SIM Center was to, I called it a simulation academy. I wanted to train people to get them all on the same page. Because what I found out sometimes, at, at, this is at Hopkins, they will, med students will be immersed not as a doctor, but as the med student, med student year two. Well, they can't do anything. They've got to call their resident or intern. Where in nursing, we're immersing the nurse as the RN. If, if we just immerse them as a student nurse, they couldn't do anything anyway without calling the instructor. So I found differences like that and say, why do you, why do, you do what that? And it's not right or wrong, but you got to learn from each other. And then when we did scenario writing together. So they were interprofessional sims, and everybody needed to own them. It's nice when you get them, but it's nice when you write them too because we, we want to do it for a pediatric population or we want one on ortho or whatever we decide. But we had evening writing sessions and it was fun because each discipline would take turns bringing pizza and salad one night and we would work like 5 to 8, 5.30 to 8.30, something like that. But we would always go back to our hospital people and say, what should we rewrite those scenarios on? And again, go back to the five top errors or 10 errors or whatever we needed, and it was easy. We all needed to recognize uh, because there were physician errors, nursing errors. They had it all. The hospital had records. They had the thing. So um, as we move, I see in the States, we're talking the talk. We're trying to get the infrastructure. In fact, uh, just in September, there was a national IPE center named at the University of Minnesota. And it was a collaborative funding came in from Josiah Macy, Robert Wood Johnson, millions of dollars to have this national center. I'm not real clear what the center's all going to do. They, they've got some guys, they're, what they're going to do, first of all, they've targeted eight pioneer schools they're going to work with because what happens, there's no use to replicate everything all the time. What can they deliver? And one thing we have had, just what you guys have, your IPE competencies. I've seen your competencies. There's America. There's uh, four uh, 
domains of competencies. Um, anyway, th that's good when they're standardized and we can develop our simulations around those competencies. So that makes it easier for everybody. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, a, it's a growing body. And people want to do collaborative practice, but it's hard finding sites and real good sites. Uh, it's clear well, at the top. Lobbying, I don't think I need I'll repeat you too. How's that? In the world of education, I was really excited to hear you talk about the residency program. And what we have here, as I would say, is the new grad initiative, but it isn't for all new graduates in nursing. And it's six months. But the idea of integrating simulation into that residency slash new grad initiative, who would fund that in the model that you're talking about? the simulations in the residency program, it's all these residencies are falling back on the hospitals. So they're being funded by hospitals and the hospitals are cutting back to make, make use for that, truthfully. I mean, um, I'm j we just heard across the street at Hopkins, the nurse, nursing budgets cut 5% across. And some of us to make money uh, for the residency programs. Some of us because we're in a sequester because of the economic status and the financial and everybody's scurrying around with that. Um, but ultimately, and, and then there's different pricing structures. And that's what I was going to talk a little bit about in the next uh, session. Changes are occurring and we've got to heed to that. Um, but simulations, I think, are very real. They need to be in there for new grads. And by the way, just on a side point, I've heard employers, and some of this is taking place. It's not real prevalent yet, but I, I look for it to grow. Before hospitals hire new grads, they may put them in simulations to see who do I want to hire. Because if a nurse leaves after six months, it's about $60,000 down the drain because of orientation and everything. There's evidence on that. There's economic models. They don't want to lose them. And most recently, I was in a think tank with some hospital leaders and academics, and we were just talking. And I was fascinated hearing about hearing the people who are hiring students. And this was not in my state. This was out of another state. But what they look for, they give them inventories. It's almost like mental health inventories or something. or health. It's an inventory. Are they going to be a good team player? Are they going to stay with us? Some of them said if they even smelled like smoke or anything, they're not going to hire them because of high-risk insurance and all that. If they ask why they become a nurse, if it's not falling in the place they want, you know, just because my mom was a nurse and I say that, and that's why I wanted to be a nurse, probably won't hire them. I mean, I was just amazed at why they won't hire them. But one other tidbit on that is I did an institute for, that's at Southern Indiana Consortium I talked about with a hospital, baccalaureate program, community college. And we did faculty development on developing SIMS and running SIMS and all that. And through an institute, people actually develop SIMS. I put them in small group. And then you have to run it and debrief it. And to do that, I asked for student volunteers within the community. And I had some student volunteers, and they were new graduates. They had just graduated. So, and so, fine, that's great. And they were really excited about the practice because they just graduated. And these were basic SIMS we built. I mean, nothing like so elaborate you, would, you couldn't imagine. Um, but after these students went through these SIMs, there were four, four, group, four sets, employers said, I know who I would hire. Because there, you can see in SIMs, those nurses that think like a nurse, and, and these are not prepared situations, but I mean, everybody should be able to care for an acute ad, uh, abdomen or you know what, whatever that is. And when they can't think and they futz around and they're not prioritizing, it's like, boy, she's gonna take a lot of work or he's gonna take a lot of work, you know? So they, they were talking among themselves, it would probably behoove us to put people in SIMS. And I'm not so sure that's not going to happen. That's another use of SIMS. Um, so. But funding sources, is, is that, that is a big one. It is. But that's where you could partner with academe and um, clinical, too. Meaning, if we're, if we're going to do SIMS at the end of program, or they're doing it at the hospital at the beginning of the program, they should, they should be similar. We should be on the same page. Or we should work together in doing that. Because we want to, we don't want this practice academe grab. I'm embarrassed by that. It needs, to, it means, needs to be better. But I think as an educator, I'll speak for myself. I've been oblivious many times, thinking I, the students were prepared. But when I see them in Sims many times, they're not. They're not. But it doesn't take long to get them there once they get that experience. But you and the hospital are given them that experience way after they've graduated, and it's real, real patience, and that's the problem. I guess the second part of my question has to do with the role of the continuing education and use of simulation in post-grad um, emergency 
program? Well, there's your re that's your revenue source right there. I think uh, centers are going to become, you know, to keep up certifications, you have to demonstrate, you know, so many hours or so many, like, um, you know, the, the sedation that has to go through, and there's competencies that have to be. We have what's called joint commission in the, hosp in the hospitals where the hospitals get accredited. I mean, they, they want documentation of this annual event or that these nurses are still competent or medicine still competent or whatever. I think in a SIM area, you, you could become the site to do those competencies or you could do the testing. Um, and that's where SIM centers coming in uh, for the clinical organizations. But again, you can work with academe. Um, on that and that could be revenue generating but that's how you're going to pay for some of this stuff you could, and that's what we're doing in schools of nursing I'll say across the state we have to diversify our revenue how can we bring in more revenue because we're really tuition dependent and as higher education becomes more experienced the economy's not good we've got to look at other ways to bring money in and try to keep that tuition low we've got 20 minutes left how do you want to use that with a few more questions um, or you had something more that you wanted to share with us what do you guys want? I'm, I wanted to ask you the question about evaluation and simulation mm -hmm. because there's certainly a question about it's for learning and reflection, but mm -hmm. then you talked about high stakes evaluation and using simulation to actually evaluate capability or competency. If you could, so let me yeah let me talk about that. Then I think what I'll do is just get do like ten minutes of slides to do highlights, and then you guys read them on your own. How's that? But I'll tell you why I put them in and why it's important. Is that fair enough? And then, uh, then you can email me if you want further or whatever. How's that? And then we'll stay the last five minutes for another Q&A if somebody's got real questions. So evaluation piece, uh, simulations are being used for assessment and evaluation. I think there's a place for them. They should be. A lot of times, I bet you've got a differentiator. Am I in a simulation now because it's a teaching learning intervention and it's okay if I make a mistake, you're not going to cut my arm off or give me an F or anything. It's just learning. It's a formative learning piece. That's good. That's what we're using. Students need to be aware of that. that that's fine. That, they, they know it's a safe place to make mistakes. I heard that in students when I debriefed them, you know, uh, uh, at Hopkins. However, um, if it's for evaluation, that's fine, but you need to say like today, December 5th, I'm going to put you in this simulation and it's, it's high stakes or it's 30% of your grade or whatever. So the students know today is an evaluation. This is no longer just an intervention. And some of the guidelines with that, if they're going to be evaluated using the simulation on December 5th, students should have had an opportunity to practice on this. This should not be the first time they've ever seen a mannequin and they've got to take a blood pressure on Sim Man or I Stan or whomever. They, they've had to be practicing and, and understand that. I'll give you an example. I worked with an acute care nurse practitioner and she had a three hour theory course and instead of three hours of lecture every week, she had one hour lecture then took took the 15, 18 students to lab and they ran SIMS. And her, she brought her content to life through SIMS and they did it and all that. And they did this week after week after week. And so it was iterative, they grew. Then on December 5th, she said, today we're, it's evaluation. This is, this is what I'm evaluating on you, this. These are the cases, this is the criteria. I mean, nothing new. Students need to know what they're being evaluated on. I mean, you don't give them the test, but you give them objectives. They know the blueprint. They know it's over chapters, you know, three through ten or whatever. She did the same. They were going to be evaluated on three cases. Maybe one's a cardiovascular, a diabetic, or whatever. And she did the testing. And she made it high stakes. If they failed, they failed, and they had to repeat the course because she felt they should have been prepared all through for that end date. And they did well. They did well. There should not be any surprises here. That's when it's detrimental, I think, to students. But the other thing when you're evaluating, and by the way, when she did it for high stakes, it was videotaped. Because say if they were intubating and they contaminated, she said, no, I didn't contaminate. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Okay, let's pull up the video. And then you can see. So that's that. Um, you've got to get the evaluation tools right. That's part of the, I th the pitfall, if you will. We'll go back to that. Too many times I think people try to evaluate and it's, it's too subjective or it's not really clear and ah, I'm going to get, I'm going to fail you. You, you. You'll do better just redoing it anyway. Where maybe it wasn't really a valid uh, evaluation. So tools become important. I know we use checklists a lot. That's okay as long as it's very distinct. But uh, even in the National Council on some of that, that Creighton tool, 
it would say assess, I can't remember exactly, but there might be a global state and assess safety parameters or something. But what do you really mean? What do you want them? That the side rails are up, that the beds, you know, what, what do you want in that scenario? Another one, assess uh, labs. What specifically is critical labs you want to, you know, for pancreatitis, it's the, you know, amylase, lipase, whatever. So, so you're real consistent with that. All right. Any other, does that help on evaluation? It's, it's, it's moving, it can be, uh, it's not unknown. It just needs to be uh, very clear when you're doing that. Okay, this is, um, I, I, uh, Marlene asked me to talk a little bit of something like that. And we have, we have lots of changes going on in the States. And I, I think you probably do too, but I, I don't want it, this to be too American, but I, I can just say, our health, let me say this, our health care is changing a lot because we have Accountable Care Act coming, and some of you might have heard it as Obamacare, Affordable Care, Accountable Care. Those are all, it's changes in our health care. And everybody's scurrying around because they don't know what that means. Um, and you can ask five different people and they'll tell you five different things. And then the report's like this big, and nobody's read the report. But I do know uh, reimbursement structures at the hospitals are changing. What the Accountable Care Act means, uh, if you're discharged, say, with congestive heart failure, if you come back in to the hospital with congestive heart failure within 30 days, you won't, the hospital won't get reimbursed. So what hospitals are doing is doing their best to do really good discharge and post-discharge planning, family caregiving, because they're not going to be paid if those patients come back in. And then you're finding these intermediate things being set up, maybe nurse managed clinics or whatever. So if the CHF patient gets in trouble, don't go to the hospital, but here, here's another ancillary type center. Are you following me? But what I believe, and I'm gonna flip through the slides and you can read on your own time, I believe simulations have a great impact and can and play here. Think of simulations in the patient care world. If, if we don't want our patients coming back, they, and, and you know how it is, many times I'll say in nursing, we say, and don't forget to do patient teaching. We do it a wave of a hand. We never tell students exactly what they need to do. And if you look at the literature on average, I think patient teaching six minutes or discharge is six minutes. I mean, really? They really know what they're doing in six minutes? No, they don't. They don't. But now that's become escalated. That's really, really important in our health care because we don't want them to come back in. And it's really, really patient focused. And we want, to, we want them to be able to uh, self-care and be independent, and it's all about health and decreasing obesity and health promotion and all that. So income simulations, I think simulations, and this is uh, looking at your revenue and, and, and the clinical and academe. Should academe be partnering with our clinical agencies and all that and do better discharge models? And that is put patients and caregivers in SIMS. Don't just demonstrate one little three minute wound care thing done and you think they know how to do it because they don't. By the way, recently, I think it was, in the, it was a hospital in Baltimore, we said, what's your number one return in EDs? What do those patients keep coming back in for? It's wound infections. To me, that sounds so simple. Why aren't we te doing a better job on caring for the wound and maybe they're not taking the antibiotics? I, I don't know what's happening, but that, I heard that. So anyway, you put patients, you put caregivers in these SIMs. Maybe one's just typical care of the wound. Let's use that example. Maybe another one, there's red streaks up the arm now from the wound. What are you going to do? You know, you don't sit on it for three days thinking that's going to get better. You know, these common occurrences, let's, let's immerse them in and role play and, and get those in. So I think simulation centers have a big play in that. But uh, so I just wanted to preface that as I was through some of these. So I talk about the workforce, it's changing our needs of education because we have to look at that. We have to produce graduates that match our workforce needs. That's why academe needs to talk to leaders in the hospitals in the community because they have to match. We can keep doing the same thing that we're doing, but it's not going to help if we're not meeting the needs of society. Um, I told you that's changing our, how we're treating uh, patients. I wanted to talk about the Affordable Care Act, and IPEs making a difference, uh, increasing value in clinical organizations, um, which is we need to partner with. Uh, that's just what I said about the Health Care Act and simulations coming in. IPE, you guys know what's going on, but that's changing the way we teach too. 
In fact, I go back to our simulation enhanced curriculum. Remember, we voted on that across seven courses at 20% SIMS, 15 to 20. 3 to 5% needs to be IPE. Where's that going? We need to consistently, as an academic dean, I say I want a sustainable, integrated model of IPE. I don't want it just higgledy-piggledy. Oh, we're doing this over here and this over here. No, it needs to be sustained across every semester. And we're working with med students on that, and they have a passport model in medicine. Med student one pairs up with our semester one. Med student two with our semester two. So, but you got to have the leaders at the table to do all that. And that's changing the model, you know, from traditional where we're just observing, but now we're learning together each discipline. I defined all of that. And I like this picture because many times this is what we do. You know, we're separate. And then I've visited SIM centers and I say, are you guys interprofessional and doing interprofessional SIMs and all that? And they said, oh yeah, we are. But what that means, nursing's on Tuesday, medicine's on Wednesday, and, and allied. So they're really, they're more here, the multidisciplinary, they're in here, but they're not working together. And here we really want interdisciplinary where they're all working together. And that's hard to figure out. It's really easier to work by yourself, but that's not the way we, we should go. The trends are, and we're building uh, interprofessional uh, SEM centers, interprofessional schools. You've got gathering sites right here, open spaces. That's great. A little bit about history. We have our IPEC. Those are our core competencies. You folks also have your own. And those were the four core competencies, value, ethics, roles, communication, teamwork. So all of our SIMs in interprofessional, we can track those competencies, and that's what we want to do. Uh, they're easy to do. I mean, every SIM can have communication. I go to those practice readiness, communication. Some of those were similar. Uh, those you know. Uh, competencies, there's studies out there where IPE competencies are being met through simulation, so the evidence is coming out. We need more evidence. I've heard, I've gone to, uh, I was just in Washington, D.C. at an IOM Global IPE Forum. And what they're calling for are outcomes, the evidence. When IPE, when we work in teams, we're efficient, we're in education, and then we go to the collaborative practice, what are those outcomes? Are we making differences in the length of patient stay at the hospital and less complications? What's that look like? Um, this was a little bit about the evidence. That's why I pulled it. You know, just, and I probably should have done this one before, this, this uh, session before the other one, but whatever. B bottom line, studies are not very rigor in clinical education. It's, this is just announcing what I've told you early this morning. There's not a lot of evidence. You can see it. Um, there's surveys out there. There's uh, articles saying that we need to do better, and we keep doing the same thing over and over. Uh, here, here's a study that goes clear back saying 12% of the time students weren't engaged. But I'm telling you, there's a more recent study that's going to come out uh, from Gonzaga, IU, and uh, Hopkins on that. Um, also, people are saying that uh, we just need to change. That's more, more, more of that type. Uh, questions? I don't know about you guys, but part of our problem at our school, we run a lot on adjunct faculty. There's so many part-time faculty. We have less full-time, but more part-time. They're wonderful clinicians, but they've never been developed to be educators. No fault of anybody, we just don't have time. We just hire them in, and then many times um, they're not asking the right questions. Maybe they're just asking, you can see they ask yes or no questions. They're not trying to get to the critical thinking for the students, so that's another factor coming in. And if you look at the research, uh, we ask low to high questions. Nurses aren't prepared. Uh, and then talked about more of the literature supporting simulations are making a difference, so I pulled some of that. Yet it's embryonic, we need more, but there's studies out there saying where simulations are making a difference, and I just gave you a little overview, not, not comprehensive at all. Uh, that was about a PEDS area, more qualitative, quantitative. That's that big one I showed you. Um, Evidence, there's evidence in debriefing, feedback, all kinds of evidence that that's working, that's where students are connecting the dots. And so don't ever forget debriefing. I'd rather run a 10 minute sim and a 20 minute debriefing than the opposite. Many people think they're learning when they're immersed, they are, but it's that reflection afterwards where it's really connecting the dots. Um, another evidence base is this uh, deliberate practice curriculum. Have you heard of that? This is, uh, if you look down here, it's by Erickson as the theorist, but deliberate to practice, and I've done a couple of studies using that. The goal is expert performance. 
and we're using deliberative practice a lot with skills. I did a study on cardiovascular assessment and technique, and that was deliberative practice. We wanted to get them to perform. And what you do, uh, well, the study is with Harvey. Have you seen Harvey the simulator? He's, but he's, he's heart sounds. He's got beautiful heart sounds, mitral heart sounds over the mitral. Anyway, I want to go back here a minute. With deliberative practice curriculum, there, is, there are clear objectives. So if, you, if you, you have to meet objectives at level one before you go to level two, and they're very clear. There's no vagueness, no gray. Either you meet them or you don't meet them, and you can't advance till you meet them, and everybody knows that. And then you go and you become very proficient and an expert performer. This was a study with Harvey with advanced practice nurses. But you can just see here, I mean, from, um, and the green is indicating uh, the findings from here, pretest to post. And the findings, meaning they had to detect mitral regurgitation, uh, all of that, and then the technique uh, improved. So you can see that was significantly different going through this deliberative practice curriculum on cardiovascular assessment and technique. Uh, also, there's literature out there saying if you don't practice on something, you have skill decay. How many times in nursing or allied health, the students learn something semester one, and by semester four, they have no clue what they're doing, but they didn't know they needed to remember something from three semesters ago? So I just ask you educators, how much to prevent skill decay, how much, what are those critical skills we need to keep putting in SIMS so that they're repetitive and they get used to it? Just, be, just because they had it in semester one, it doesn't mean it goes away. It's iterative. They build upon that. And then I just wanted to talk about clinical SIMS in the workplace because that's going to impact us, and that's in the workplace. We, as an academic institution, needs to work with the workplace. We need to be in harmony and synchrony with that. There's no use two of us doing different things. That's why those partnerships are important. And I'll just briefly talk about the onboarding, the orientation. If the hospital is doing something on onboarding the SIMS, maybe we're doing our, our SIMS before they graduate. But what's that look like? And they build upon each other. There's literature out there about onboarding and doing a better job. Onboarding I, means with orientation. You, I'm using that. Thing. Here's the competency assessment you mentioned back there. That, that should be, too. There are annual assessments that hospitals have to document. Uh, can we, as academics, some of our practice people also have to? Should we be partnering together to make sure we're all uh, getting our competencies met? One of certifications, another one, you know, when we go through ACLS and all that, that's there. Also, our instructors have to go through that. But here's one uh, example of a partnership where the uh, competencies were needed, and this was a red flag. I'm going to make this up, but there was a, I'm not making it up, but I'm, I'm de-identifying the identifier, so you don't know what about this. But there was a unit at a hospital where they discovered like 80% of the nurses were new, brand new nurses. And I'd say it was a renal transplant unit. And it's like it was an accident waiting to happen. All new nurses uh, covering all these shifts, and they're novice. So the hospital partnered with the academic institution, and they identified competencies for this renal nurse transplant nurses needed. You know, eight competencies, 10, I don't know what they were. And they developed simulations with the academic area and put all these nurses through these critical simulations. So, you know, with the, if there was an anaphylactic shock or whatever, they knew what to do. They did pre and post. It was phenomenal. So everybody, it was a win-win situation. Academe helped. They used the SIMS then in the curriculum where they needed to, and then the hospital felt better prepared. But that was a true partnership in helping uh, outcomes, patient safety, and all of that. Certifications are important here, staff de uh, education development, anything you want to teach your new equipment, any, any new thing. I know I had an OB um, clinician call me once, and OB were having a lot of near misses, safety problems. And the root cause analysis, communication, communication between the physician and the nurse. So they said, can simulations help? Of course, set the simulations up on what you're, what you're dealing with and run, you gotta run these interprofessional sims. That's what they needed to do, that's what they could do. And that's uh, development. You look at your problems and simulations can help. Team steps is a big one for continuing ed to do the uh, teamwork, that's you know competencies, those are there. Barriers we talked about, sacred cows, there's so many barriers, those are only a few. They think there's you know, time commitment, we can't do it, but if you do it right, it's gonna save, uh, and it, you'll have better outcomes in the long run and probably save uh, money. 
future is uh, lots of possibilities, as I said. And I always like this picture and end with that because ultimately that's what we're all about. So how's that for like, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> I'm looking at Marlene. She's like, oh. <laughs> uh, so now we have about five minutes for Q&A. So final questions. About what? Hello, just wondering if you could comment on uh, debriefing the debrief. The debriefing? No, debriefing the debrief. Oh, debriefing the debrief. You mean uh, with the faculty development session? Um, when I've done institutes and run them with faculty and I debrief their debrief, I've watched them debrief and not jump in and I sit on my hands and there's a, a debriefing tool called the DASH tool. I can share with you. You've probably seen it. There's seven points and all that. I, I kind of score. And I give feedback. I, I, I'm just very honest because it's all about trying to make them better debriefers. And debriefing is an art. I use advocacy inquiry a lot. But it's a way you ask the questions you know, back. And a good debriefing, of course, is would be the learners, the students, orientees talking more than, than you're talking. And you're pulling it out. And I know many times probably the biggest pitfall, I'll go back to that word, in debriefing, there's teaching moments missed there too. When you hear something right away, um, you should ask them to expound on it, ask the student to expound on it. And you'd be surprised how much you can pull out. And I learn about my learners. But not only does it help the learners understand in debriefing what should have been done, it always helps me from an educator point of view, what I need to be doing differently. If the gaps aren't being made and I'm seeing that, then that helps me think about my teaching. How can I do that better? Because they're, they're evidently not getting it. And by the way, I thought they probably got it until I saw them. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's happened repeatedly. And other instructors, they're always just amazed sometimes. But then it always feels good when, I, I don't want to be, always be on the negative, it feels good when you see them putting it together and it's like, oh my goodness, they've got it together. So, any surprises today? Anything you heard or what's your takeaway? Because I always love coming to different countries. I don't consider you guys like a real different country, but you know what I mean? <laughs> in fact, I forgot to get the thing, you know, got a right to, to come in to immigration or something. I even forgot to get that paper because I, you know, I think we're all similar, but I had to write that down. I think that's a really important question. I was going to ask it at the end, but I think for your benefit, what uh -huh. were some of those really big takeaways? You know, that, ah, oh, that's a great way to think about this. I'm, I'm going to take this away. This was significant. Can we share that with Pam as our maybe parting gift to her as she goes back? When you were talking about the high stakes uh, simulation, we do remediation evaluation in sim here. So if somebody's been pulled from clinical because of unsafe practices, they go through a remediation process, but then we can't bring them back to the hospital and assess them with a the patient, so we do it in sim. So my takeaway is to really look at our evaluation tool and make sure that it's as standardized as it can be. Mm -hmm. uh, we do base it on the competencies of nursing, but it is something that I'm thinking that maybe we need to just really make sure that it's clear. We do share it in advance, mm -hmm. and they're very, very well aware. Good. But I wonder, do you have a comment on that? You know, I, I, students need to be aware of what you're evaluating them on. You know, that's a, that's a best practice. And uh, I, I'm glad to hear that you're using SIMS for remediation. I think that's important. We do, too. We use SIMS for clinical makeup team, too. You know, there might be eight or ten students, and they might be from three different courses, truly, but we'll have a makeup on a Saturday or a late afternoon on a Friday to 8.30 at night or something. It's never... It's not something you want to do, you know, but we want them to do clinical makeup. And truthfully, even if it's a junior student with a senior student, you can put them in scenarios together and you, you accomplish that. It's kind of fun. In fact, they kind of like it. I don't want them to be missing clinical to do this. But, uh, but you're right about the evaluation tools are always a problem and, you know, getting the psychometrics on it, making sure they're valid and all that. Share some scenarios with evaluation measures, the evidence-informed scenarios. There were a number that you went through, OB, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Remember that comment? The, we had some scenarios. Oh, from the National Council when they yeah. were surveyed? You had some scenarios, I thought, that you said you oh. developed the evidence-informed ones. I had, I, I forget what I said, but oh, here's a couple. No, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> it's on tape. Well, I need to you. rewind. Well, here, here, maybe, maybe this is what I said. First of all, the National Council did that survey, so on PEDS faculty, and these are the top 20 PEDS things or whatever. I have that list from everything, if you want to see that list, from pediatrics, OB, community. So that's the list of scenarios. Then I also said, if you want, if you're psych and you want to connect with my psych faculty to get, to get psych SIMS or SHARE, you know, they can do, I would do that. Is that what you're referring to? So can I suggest to make it easier as opposed to, there are 120 people here who could email you. Can I suggest that we might come, uh, email you directly and we could then send out those, that information to the assembled group? The, oh, yeah, yeah, please We will do. take that on, the email for the, those resources, and then we'll send it out to everyone that's here. Because you don't want 120 emails on the same subject. No, but uh, emails do trigger me, and if I don't, I mean, I try, I try to be responsive, honestly. So but then if somebody Barb Todd. But what? There's Barb Todd, your assistant. Yeah, Barb Todd, you know Barbara well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, poor Barbara. <laughs> Drive her crazy, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, so if you want me to connect you with something, then I, I will, but then maybe ha what, whatever your process is, yeah. Well, if, if they connect me, then, then they'll send it out to the rest yeah. of the people. That's yeah, We'll yeah. connect with you and then send yeah. it out, and then it's over and over yeah, between yeah. someone and someone else. Right. Okay. Well, I would say don't do it alone. There's even listservs out there if you're on there, and sometimes I'm on the listserv, somebody will say, well, I need this type of scenario X, Y, Z, and boom, somebody's sending it. Honestly, sim, sim people are very friendly people, I think. They want to share for the most part. I mean, we all know what people are going through. It's time intensive. Also, um, and you probably know this, and I'm not trying to sell it or anything, but Lairdall has a sim store, so you can go download sims. Do you know that? It's like iTunes. I thought that was pretty fun. Uh, those high stakes are going to be coming out from NLN, but also NLN has geriatric free scenarios now. If you go to NLN, just Google that. National League for Nursing, .org, NLN.org, and uh, they're called the ACEs cases. ACEs means ex uh, extenuating, I don't know, quality care in, in elderly patients. But there are four scenarios that unfold. So one case, Millie, there's three cases on Millie. And like one's a home care, one's in the hospital, they're different segments. And they're, they're priceless, they're free. They're free, and also there's a monologue. You can hear Millie. Hi, I'm Millie, and she talks like an 83-year-old and all that. She's got Snuggles the cat. But we use that in, in class. Everybody might hear about Millie. And then we have students write, what questions would you like to ask Millie? Because there's some incompleteness there. And then it builds. They see Millie then week three, week five in Sim Lab or something. So that's the characters they get to know. And that's all on geriatrics, and that's free. NLN.org. Sorry, I had to. I, I like to tell them about free stuff. Yeah, it's very helpful yeah. because our financial situation is no different than yours. Yeah. Uh, one final question, one final comment. You know what I heard you say was a simulation based curriculum. Yeah. And that I thought was a very interesting concept because it seems to me it's a different step than adding sim here, sim here, and sim here. And maybe you could just talk a little bit about that because I think s those are some of the shifts that I see from today for the future? Well, um, I challenged our faculty in baccalaureate curriculum because people were doing it here and here and there. And we were just coming off the study. So to me, that was a springboard. We already had a lot of people trained in SIM because I had a SIM team running this. Plus, we have a lot of scenarios. So it was just a perfect moment not to bypass this. So I wanted to go to faculty and say, what do you want? How are we going to do this? Also, I got to tell you, there's some, there were some negative people. Not everybody buys into this. Some people think SIMS, it needs to be real clinical and not SIMS. But once we establish it within the curriculum across seven courses, then, then people are committed to it. You got to do it. But it also helps my SIM, not only my SIM team, but the SIM manager and all that to get resources, to schedule. We've got a rhythm now. But when people are just here and there and all over, and then they forget and it's reactive and there's no, it's not methodical. And also, it's, it's not helpful to the student. I, as I told you what I saw from the National Council, but I, again, don't know the results. This is just me, preliminary findings. The anxiety decreases from semester one to two to three to four. 
But if you still keep it random and all that, it's not going to help that anxiety. But also, it helps build their skill. I mean, we always do S bar. I suppose you guys do S bar communication that starts at you know level one and keeps going and going. And they they get some of this stuff is routinized. You know, becomes routine and that you want it how to introduce and five rights and all this kind of stuff. So um, I just challenged my faculty, and that's what I call it, a simulation-based uh, curriculum. And oh, they had a lot of dialogue about it. We ended up using uh, Caltrex or SurveyMonkey, and they had to vote whether they wanted you know, 10 to 15, 15, 20, 25, 30. You know, we had three choices because everybody, that's what they put out. Um, so we're just embarking on that. Except for the past two years, we've really had a lot of sim just because of the study. So I'm excited. Uh, I think it's good. And by the way, we've done wonderful sims on disaster. I, I know you guys have. I saw your program on concurrent. We've done one on organ transplant where the organ transplant teams comes over. It's very collaborative. It's phenomenal. So lots of different ideas. In psych, have you heard hearing voices? You done that one? That was part of uh, one that was uh, pretty phenomenal. So. Hope that helps. Well, I think we've been treated to two hours of wonderful mm -hmm. sharing. Oh, well, Thank you, Pam. Thank you.